We now move on to the final arc of Black Lagoon, at least so far in the five episode OVA series Roberta's Blood Trail. This is also the final of the three big arcs I highlighted in part two. Roberta's Blood Trail serves as the biggest piece of character development for Rock in the entire show and shows us the layers hidden beneath Rowanapa. This may be my favorite part of Black Lagoon, so let's get into it. For Roberta's Blood Trail, we get a remixed OP, but it's still predominantly a Revy feature piece, but Garcia and Roberta are also featured in some parts. Rock, Revy and Benny are also in there briefly. The song and the visuals are probably equally as good as the first one in my opinion. You can't go wrong with either. We open with a character introduction for Shane, the leader of the American NSA agents. It's a literal Nam flashback where he's defending a young Vietnamese girl from some of his fellow soldiers. Obviously Vietnam is not exactly one of America's fondest memories to look back on, and notoriously their soldiers brutalized the Vietnamese people, and that's what's being highlighted here. However, the good and the bad of the Americans are on display here, and from the very fact that Shane is still alive in the story, it's safe to say that these would-be child rapists are fucking dead now. We then cut back to Venice. Venezuela 26 years later, which puts Black Lagoon occurring in either 1995 or 1996 because some time has passed since this assassination. Here we see Shane and the squad successfully blowing young Garcia's father to hell. Roberta, who accompanied the Lovelace Patriarch, is caught off guard by this and isn't able to save him. Later at his funeral, we see Garcia again, and he asks Roberta how some people could be so heartless. It's important that Garcia verbally says these things now so we can track his character development since by the end of the arc he'll understand why these men did what they did and forgive them. Roberta internally admits that she understands exactly how people could be this cruel. We get a shower scene with Roberta here. Take note because this is going to be used to parallel Revy in a few episodes. She will have a nearly identical scene. In the shower we flash back to Garcia's father taking her in and as she finishes her shower having reflected on these events she vows revenge for the family and decides to use the family's heirloom gun to do it. She says that if she must burn in hell to save the master and the young master, so be it. If we needed any more initial interest, we then flash to the literal CIA headquarters. The main CIA person we will see throughout this arc, who's presumably Edda's boss, is ranting about how annoying it is that the NSA troops, who we just saw in Venezuela, are now currently in Rowanapa. He describes Rowanapa as that nice garden we've been growing. If you needed any further confirmation that the Americans were the ones running Rowanapa, behind the scenes, this scene serves as a confession. And the most interesting thing about this is that it all runs through Edda. He also has a line where he says, the game is about getting as much as you can without starting a war, which is one hell of a summary of foreign intervention in the US, if ever I've heard one. It's important to say that this arc is by and large a political feud between US intelligence agencies, between the CIA and the NSA. Telling a story about proxy battles between the CIA and NSA seems pretty ambitious for this dumb fun action show. We cut back to the NSA troops and they talk about how shitty of a situation they're in being stuck in Rowanapa currently. They mention that they can't fly out because the Thailand Navy isn't exactly on their side and is going to have some questions about NSA troops flying out of their country. They mention that this is the CIA's backyard, showing that at least they know that much. This brings up an interesting point. How many people in the city actually know that the CIA is truly running things? Chang knows, obviously. He's sort of their puppet that they constantly disrespect. Edda knows because she is a CIA agent. The head sister of the ripoff church knows because she's housing Edda, but that's likely it. Balalaika has never shown any indication that she knows. It could be possible that Chang only won the last war because the CIA backed him. And Rock certainly doesn't know because he figures out that there must be a shadowy figure controlling Rowanapa from the outside, but he has no idea who or what they are. This CIA dynamic adds a whole nother layer to everything we know about Rowanapa and makes things extremely interesting, and I love it. The troops explain their frustration that they are in danger because of insider politics between the CIA and the NSA. They comment on the city itself explaining that it smells like gutter trash, which continues Revy's motif about smelling the corruption on people. Notably, these soldiers seem to not put themselves in the same camp as everyone in Rowanapa, even though they were just involved in a terroristic plot. They see themselves as better than these criminals. They then go through the corruption they see on the streets of Rowanapa and notice Rock, who they all agree seems entirely out of place. We're now 10 minutes in and this is the first time we see our main characters. They watch as Rock gets pickpocketed by a child, but we see Ravi interrupt the robbery, getting his wallet back for him. We see Rock making a pickup and inside the place there's a game of Russian roulette happening. A dude ends up dead and everyone starts laughing and cheering. At the beginning of every arc, the show feels the need to remind us how fucked up Rowanapa is. Rock is extremely casual about all this and doesn't seem to care. The dude promises the money tomorrow after he mentions that Revy is nearby. He finally meets back up with Revy who gives him his wallet back. He says that she should have let the street kid have the money. 
Revy says that'd be a bad idea and the kid would end up picking up the wrong wallet and getting himself killed. Revy remarks about him always wanting to save people blindly, just like the girl in his wallet. Suddenly, Rock's demeanor in the beginning of the episode makes sense. He's still depressed about the situation with Yukio. As I mentioned in part 3, he will not forget his failure back in Japan, especially with this photo of her in his wallet. Rock seems surprised that Revy went through his wallet, they don't seem to be as close as they used to be. We have no idea how much time has passed since their trip to Japan, but it's likely Rock has been like this since then. And they especially can't have been fucking if she hasn't seen the inside of his wallet. Rock takes a look at the picture, then flashes back to everything that happened in Japan. They go to eat in the place that looks like the location of the cigarette kiss scene, which is interesting. Notably, last time, Rock was the one confidently eating, and Revy was the one out of it, and this time it's the exact opposite. Back then, it was Revy that was going through an identity crisis, but now it's Rock's turn. He's still scared to move forward any further and fully embrace this lifestyle, even after Yukio's death. Revy points out that Rock has been trying to save people ever since he got here, but has repeatedly failed. He failed on the U-boat with her, he failed with the twins, and he failed with Yukio. She says it's pointless and impossible, and she laughs about how much she loves Roanapa. This is basically cleverly hidden exposition, so the audience understands that Rock is finally going to save someone this time. Dutch gets a phone call from the police asking if they've had a strange visitor yet. After hanging up, he mentions that everyone in town seems to be hinting at a stranger showing up. He then gets a call from Revy saying that Roberta is back in town, to which Dutch has an appropriate reaction. He is not happy. Revy, however, is quite excited. The city is buzzing as they should be, and the audience understands the impact she had last time. She's almost become a folk legend in Roanapa. We cut back to Rock and Revy hanging out at the yellow flag, and they notice that the triad is searching the place. It's not just here, but all over the city. Everyone is looking for the maid. The Colombians show up and start questioning Revy. Roberta was after the Colombians last time, so they want to deal with her. Revy starts insulting him and they have a fun interaction that's interrupted by Fabiola arriving and freaking everyone the fuck out because she's dressed like a maid. People begin to run out of the bar, but the Colombians seem to think this is some sort of prank. She ignores them and explains that she is here looking for the Lagoon Company, and explains that Garcia is at a hotel waiting for them. She introduces herself as Fabiola, and Revy immediately hates her because she talks like Roberta, apparently. I love Fabiola's character design, it's fucking awesome. The Colombians are idiots and start fucking with her, but before anything happens, we cut back to Benny and Dutch. Benny explains that the Lovelace father was killed in a bombing, and Dutch then understands the fucking drastic situation they are all in now. Fabiola monologues about this city smelling like shit and how she had figured it'd be like this. She attacks and famously impales someone in the fucking taint. Revy encourages the fighting by dropping a glass on the ground, which sets off all the terrified Colombians. Notably, Fabiola isn't killing anyone here. Even though it looks like she is, Revy will mention later that she hasn't killed anyone yet. The Colombians call in for backup, and we see them charging past Benny and Dutch who are in the car on the way to the yellow flag. Revy laughs as the bar is destroyed again, and Rock is still showing no moral outrage. Fabiola says Roberta was right and the city is full of garbage. She tells everyone to get out that hasn't been already knocked out. We then cut to Chang being informed of the situation. He figures out that it'd be pointless for them to go rushing in now, and decides to track down Garcia instead. He notably also calls Roanapa his city, which we will see be challenged by Etta in their upcoming phone call. We cut to the now full car with everyone from the Lagoon Company and Fabiola. Revy teases Fabiola as Dutch asks some questions. When they arrive in the hotel, Fabiola is surprised to find Chang in Garcia's room. She rushes to attack, and there's a subtle shot of Revy smirking, and Fabiola is summarily put down. Revy understood that she was about to get destroyed, that's why she had a little smirk on her face. She does have a thing for Chang, let us not forget, and let's not forget who Chang strikingly resembles. Garcia tells everyone to calm down and is clearly much more mature than the last time he was with the Lagoon Company. Revy comedically lights a cigarette, but Chang tells her to ask for permission first, which she does ask for and is denied. Revy is unhappy about this and makes a funny face. Garcia then explains that Roberta is hunting the people that murdered his father and that she has tracked them to Roanapa. Fabiola has a shot where she looks over at Rock. This is important because later in her final talk with Revy, she notes that that she's been watching him since they got to the city, and that she doesn't see the man that Revy describes to her when they talk later. This is all set up for that conversation, and it's an excellent little detail. Revy butts in, saying that Garcia may as well go home and jerk off, because Roberta is going to slaughter these fucking amateurs in seconds, and be home before he knows it. Sadly, this isn't true, because the Americans are involved. Garcia then has a flashback asking Roberta to stay with him, but she evidently has left him anyway. We then cut to Roberta catching her first victim on screen, 
This is not her first overall because she shows off various cell phones that she has collected in her travels. Back to Chang now, he says that it's impressive how effective she's been as Garcia describes the bodies that have been found in her wake. He says that she deserves the name Bloodhound and Garcia gets mad that he uses that term and then reiterates that Roberta is part of his family. Rock is shown clenching his fists when Garcia calls her family. He recognises that Garcia is trying to save Roberta like he tried to save countless people before. We then cut to Roberta killing an NSA agent. She uses burning coals to torture him and get the information about the other NSA agents. We also see her guzzling pills in this scene showing her fucked up state of mind. Before we cut away, the NSA agent warns Roberta, saying that every American agency will be after her now. Revy then comments how fucked up this situation is if the Americans are actually involved. We cut back to the destroyed yellow flag where Roberta actually shows up this time, much to Bao's dismay. She asks him for a list of providers she needs to find in Rwanda, including a pill guy and a gun salesman. She also warns that a war is coming. Revy explains that now no one will want to help Roberta because she's fucking with America. Rock then ends the episode with a monologue talking about this city being filled with people wanting to die. He visually imagines Garcia with the Red Cross of Death, representing his fears of unsuccessfully trying to save him. Fabiola explains that they want to hire Rock to help them find Roberta before she finds the Americans. Rock is surprised by this and says that they are both nuts. The episode ends with Rock at a crossroads. Does he try one more time to save people even though he just imagined what will happen if he fails and that Garcia will end up dead and then he'll be even more depressed and even more of a failure. We then get the new ED with not many visuals, just interesting images of certain characters as children like Balalaika and Shane, who will juxtapose and be parallels of each other throughout this season. Then we get flashes of Rock, Balalaika and Chang as the representatives of the power players in Rowanapa. This is all backed by the American marching song that's pretty fucking awesome. I love the old ED, and this is certainly no world of midnight, but this ending is better than the original. Episode 26 of Black Lagoon opens immediately on the previous episode's conversation in Garcia's hotel room. Dutch interrupts the conversation and refuses on Rock's behalf. Dutch does not want them to be involved with anything involving Roberta. He understands that Roberta is nothing but trouble and that there's no money in this. Chang and Revy both say that Roberta has no chance and is insane because she can't possibly go after America and win. Garcia gets upset and asks if he's the only person alive that wants to save Roberta. Revy calls him a pussy and says that he shouldn't have expected anything else coming to the shithole of the world, but unknowingly he's saying all the right things to convince Rock to help him. Garcia admits that she must be right and says that they will continue to look by themselves. Before the meeting ends, Rock praises Garcia and points out how much more mature he has become and says that he's starting to become a man. Garcia says he must be more mature now seeing as his father is dead and Roberta is no longer around. Chang is disappointed in Rock's response. He somehow knows that Rock has a propriety to try and save people and is playing into it. Maybe Balalaika told him about Rock's hobby. Chang then offers them his help and promises them safety in Rowanapa at one of his places. Dutch notes that he can never tell what Chang is thinking and that Chang never lets anyone know what he's thinking. He's one clever, manipulative bastard. Chang explains that Roberta going on a rampage is a problem for everyone in the city. Dutch says keeping the peace is Chang's job and that he doesn't want anything to do with it, and by he, he also means rock. Chang plays into Rock's ego, saying that he's the perfect man for the job because of his awareness of the city and his lack of certain enemies. Chang tells Rock to not let him down. Rock questions Chang's motives, but then figures out that this is all to stop a war from breaking out in the city and to stop outside eyes from looking into his city. Rock needs more time to think about it. Chang then warns the kids that if Rock says no, that they are to get out of the city immediately. Chang guilt trips Rock into helping them by saying that Garcia will have a full head of grey hair before he's 40 if he doesn't help them. This is a kid asking for help and he knows that Rock won't refuse. Rock then parallels this very situation with Chang to the one with Balalaika where she nearly killed him. We even see Chang replacing Balalaika in this part of the flashback. Rock does not like that these two are more powerful than him and that they can threaten him and make him do their bidding. Dutch is now pissed at Rock and tells him to refuse outright, but then knowing Rock's probably going to accept it, he warns him to get the fuck out of Dodge if he fails to find Roberta before war breaks out. He's telling him as his employer at this point, Dutch is staunchly opposed to everything that's going on right now. 
We cut to a conversation between Chang and his driver. The driver notes that Rock's a rarity in Roanapa because he's still holding on to his ideals. Chang says that Rock will take the job because that's just the kind of man that Rock is. He thinks he's got Rock figured out and he does successfully manipulate him into doing what he wants, but Rock will overcome him by the end of the season. Not directly, but he will. We get another Rock monologue about how Roanapa is the melting pot of different gangs and crime families fighting for power. We then cut to his room where he has a map of the city pinned to his wall. It's time for Rock to figure out his plan and show off the full extent of his tactfulness. This is what he must do if he wants to save Roberta, Garcia and Fabiola from falling into the darkness that they have all in some way escaped. He goes through the various groups that are active in the city and says that the Italians might not be involved in all this, just like they have barely been involved in the entire show up until this point. He notes that the Colombians have been in it from the start and that they will be likely calling in their best troops. He summarizes that there will be three core teams in the battle between the Colombians, the Americans and Roberta. He also concludes that this will undoubtedly be a bloodbath. Rock then calls Dutch who is still pissed at him and the situation in general. Dutch even asks for his resignation letter. Rock called him to ask him how he acquired a favour and overall such goodwill from Balalaika. Dutch explains off screen and Rock reiterates immediately afterwards what he said. At the climax of the last true war in Roanapa, Chang and Balalaika had a showdown and Chang got the shot in on Balalaika and she fell into the ocean, falling possibly to her death where Dutch picked her up, saving her life and probably all of Hotel Moscow. Rock finalises the map and has everything nearly perfectly figured out, but he's missing the most important piece that's been hiding from him since the very beginning. He has the Americans under one umbrella and is missing Edda and the CIA. This isn't his fault, as we speculated earlier, Balalaika probably doesn't even know about the large CIA presence in the city. But this is an oversight Rock will regret come the final scene of the entire show. To make the last point obvious, we cleverly immediately cut to Edda as soon as Rock thinks he has everything figured out. Revy and Edda are gambling together and Revy is losing. Edda says that she always loses after Rock does something to piss her off. Edda then points out that the two of them are always usually practically tied at the hip and it's weird seeing them apart. Many other characters will make this examination as well throughout the arc. Revy explains the circumstances between Garcia, Roberta and the Americans, which really gets Edda's attention. But she keeps it low-key. Edda starts asking about the Americans and why they even came here in the first place. Revy just says she has no idea and is tired of Rock's bullshit. Revy isn't as focused on here in Roberta's blood trail, though she will always be given something to do. Just not necessarily the most important things. But one constant about her in this arc is her relationship with Rock is not as strong as it used to be. We cut back to Rock who has clearly been up all night coming up with seemingly every possible scenario because there's writing all over his walls. Rock then takes Benny with him weirdly instead of Revy, maybe she's still at the church, and they meet up with Garcia and Fabiola. Fabiola is suspicious and curious to why Rock is helping them for no reason. She never trusts him, which is important in the overall grand scheme of the arc. They initially head towards the destroyed yellow flag where Bao is chilling with the girls from the whorehouse upstairs that also got blown apart. They're all hanging out in this blow-up pool. All the characters have funny little different reactions to this. Garcia is blushing because of the tits, Fabiola is apologetic because she destroyed the bar, Benny is slightly disinterested, he is a taken man after all, and Rock gets straight to business. Garcia somewhere in this scene finds out that Fabiola is the one that destroyed the bar and she is quite embarrassed by this. Bao initially refuses to give Rock the name of the locations fearing for his life, but eventually relents. We then see Bao's flashback to Roberta uncharacteristically chugging liquor and chomping on pills. The last time she came to her bar, she asked for water, so this is quite the juxtaposition. He notes that she wanted locations for top-up places for her pills and different gun shops around the city. As they are motioning to leave, Bao points out, much like Edda did earlier, that it's weird seeing Rock and Revy apart. He asks if the lovebirds had a fight which Rock reacts to like the lovebirds comment came out of nowhere. There's no way they're fucking after that reaction. Following that we get a montage of them travelling to the different locations on the list, but not a single person answers their door. The day ends, they get some food and Fabiola is pissed that they made no progress. Benny explains that no one wants to talk to them because they have a bunch of kids following them and one of them is dressed like Roberta. They're all terrified. Rock is impressed with Fabiola's absolute bravery and this spurs her into explaining her backstory. She grew up in a poor area that she says isn't that much different from Roanapa. That's why she knows what she's doing, sort of, in this area. She kicks Rock in the shin for exposing that she's a super soldier in front of Garcia who apparently didn't know that Fabiola was a fighter. 
She talks about learning this non-lethal fighting technique that she uses by copying someone else's moves, reminiscent of Master Splinter from Ninja Turtles or some shit. Benny points out that this non-lethal method isn't going to work out for her very long in this city. He emphasizes that she should shoot to kill and shoot often. Garcia rejects this and says this way of thinking is what got Roberta into this current mindset. They all leave and Benny is clearly annoyed. He likes to wait in the ship usually and doesn't like to get involved in situations like this. Rock asks Benny about this and he stresses that he just doesn't want to see these kids end up dead. He says that every death is like another pair of armor holding you down, and that's why he never gets involved. This theory has been proven true by Rock, who has seen many deaths that have traumatized him, and death has clearly become a normal thing to him. Just like we saw in the beginning of this OVA series with the scene in the bar. He didn't bat an eye at that Russian roulette table. And after seeing what Yukio did, it's pretty understandable. Benny says that he's not getting any further involved and asks Rock if he can carry this weight. We cut back to the ripoff church where Edda has done some research off screen. She's talking to their head sister here, explaining the situation with the NSA officers in the city and the CIA's interests in all of these events. The head sister points out that this is turning into a turf war between the CIA and the NSA that this city could do without. Edda takes up for her side saying that if this was the CIA, her and all the other agents in the area would have been notified, but they weren't and so by process of elimination this had to be the NSA. It's interesting that she says there are other CIA agents in the area. She could just be talking about Thailand in general, but she could be talking specifically about Rowanapa here. I wonder if there are any other suspicious characters around that could also be CIA. She wants to use the church's contacts to find the agents before anyone else and settle this situation. She then puts down the NSA's foreign interventionalism, saying that this is all because they wanted to manipulate Venezuelan politics. She explains that the CIA mainly focuses on manipulating economies and fathering information, not to start conflict like the NSA is doing here. Also symbolically, Edda's glasses are fully off in this scene because she's in full CIA mode. The head sister and remarks that it's hard being top dog because you start competing with yourself in reference to America's conflict here. The head sister agrees to help and Edda says that she'll get paid for the information as usual. This gives insight into the arrangement here between the ripoff church and the CIA. It's pretty interesting. Before the scene ends, the head sister mentions that Chang has arranged a full meeting with all the major players in the city. We then cut to Benny and Rock in the car, heading over to the hotel that Garcia and Fabiola are staying at. They talk, and Rock mentions that Fabiola was excited to stay at a pool house, which is a tease of a character interaction we'll see later on. Benny notes that Rock is quite distracted today. He's currently in full light Yagami mode with his unraveling predictions and plans, plus he's tired from being up all night. They see all the mob bosses heading in one direction and Rock notes that everything is going according to plan. Benny guesses that they will make a plan tonight, but Rock corrects him, saying that they will wait a little longer before doing that. He seems to have all this already figured out. We then cut to the meeting and this is an awesome scene. The shit talking starts immediately, especially between the Russians and Italians like last time. Notably, the Italians have a new boss because their last one got slaughtered by the twins, let us not forget. The Colombians are the most eager to talk because Roberto was originally their problem. The meeting continues and Chang is once again forced to keep the peace. We hear Rock narrating exactly how the meeting will go as it happens. We are seeing in this scene that Rock wasn't fucking around, and that he actually does have his shit figured out. They keep shit talking while Chang shows some anger, literally putting his foot down. Chang gives a speech here, revealing to everyone that Roberta is hunting American meat, and that the meat's hidden in their city. He even calls the Americans terrorists, which is going to make some people in the audience quite angry. The mere mention of American soldiers appropriately catches Balalaika's attention. She still has something to prove from Afghanistan. The Colombians propose placating the Americans and helping them out of the city, and Balalaika breaks down why that's a stupid idea. <laughs> Your bravery is admirable, but misguided. Our true enemy here are the soldiers she's hunting, not the maid. It's obvious what the Americans' goals are in all this. To stop the drug trade! Yeah. Chang then talks about this city lasting 35 years because everyone here desires the same thing. Rowanapa is fragile and a large outside force or foreign eyes would destroy the city entirely. These separate mafias, even if they are all unified, could not defend against a standing army, especially if it's Uncle fucking Sam looking in this direction. The ultimate irony underlining this entire scene is that Uncle Sam is very much already in control of Rowanapa. We cut to Rock who reiterates that they have to find Roberta first or the game is lost. We then cut to Roberta who is haunted by a very specific ghost from her past, an innocent man she terrorized for no reason before murdering him. 
This is important because she'll seek redemption after the main arc is over here from this person's family. This unnamed businessman in the scene acts as someone to contradict what she's thinking. She nearly attacks the dude that's hiding her in Rowanapo as she's caught off guard by his arrival because she's having these episodes. He then hands her some of the materials she requested. We then cut to both Rock and Revy in Revy's room. Rock is sitting on a notably cleaner bed than the last time we saw this area, while Revy is doing crunches. This is another outstanding scene that everyone should go back and watch. It's one of the few long scenes where the two of them just talk in this entire arc, just because so much is going on. Revy reiterates that she thinks this is still all about Yukio, and I love that they keep bringing her up because I do love continuity. But she's only partially correct here. This is about Yukio, the twins, Roberta, and even Revy herself. Rock is willing to do anything, even as we'll see throughout this arc, sacrifice his own morality to save somebody. Revy mentions that she's noticed that he started to like this game. After all, he said it himself with that balalaika incident last time. Revy asks what that makes her if she tags along with him. Rock thanks her for always sticking with him, even when his back was against the wall. She mocks his thankfulness, saying that he's truly something else. She's tired, like she said in the ripoff church, of helping him while he's being self-destructive. It's exhausting for her. Rock then introduces this analogy where he is the bullet and Revy is the gun, and that he still would have been a useless scrap of lead in Japan if she hadn't picked him up and fired him. This is similar to when he told her that she shook him awake back in the cigarette kiss scene. Rock says he's here now because he wants to be in this game. This is where we get the parallel shower scene with Revy. He says he needs this gun for it all to work. Come on, baby, light my fire. Don't you know it? It's a classic by The Doors. She starts singing a Doors song. She asks him what kind of ammo he is then, and then concludes herself that he's a silver bullet. Nobody knows exactly where he's going to go, and that you use it to kill some supernatural monster. Revy walks out of the shower, half naked here, and we do get a clear shot of Rock peeking at her ass while her back is turned. We also get an uncharacteristic boob shot of Revy. She then warns him that if you use the silver bullet at the wrong time, the monster kills you. She then tells him to go and get some water as she's getting changed. Once he's left the room, she just says, damn it, it's no fair. She can tell that he's slipping and she doesn't like it. The characters in Roberta's blood trail are far more sexualized than they have ever been before. This is only an observation because I didn't have time to factor in how this has some sort of thematic purpose or something. Being naked is usually symbolically used for vulnerability, and that does fit in both these shower scenes, but in general there's a lot more sexual references in this arc. Again, this is just an observation, and Rock's making that observation as well. We cut to Rock getting water, but as suspected, Revy just wanted to get him out so she could change. She throws a symbolic bullet at him and tells him to hurry up. We cut to them arriving at the beach house Garcia and Fabiola are staying at. Fabiola had snuck out and gone for a swim in the pool and is caught off guard when Revy arrives and makes fun of her for it. She's embarrassed in front of Garcia who reinforces in her that she could have gone to a swim at any time she liked. Revy then makes fun of them both in the back of the car and Fabiola grabs her nose as she leans back and Revy gets pissed. They start hitting up all the same contacts as yesterday An arms dealer mentions that Roberta did come through but has no other information. They hit up the next guy who's a literal fucking crackhead with a crack spoon. He also mentions that he saw Roberta. We cut away to Chang at what presumably is the ripoff church as he gets a call from Edda, presumably in another room of that same building. She's using a voice filter, of course. She explains that the Americans are on a mission to capture a high-ranking triad member connected to the drug fields on off the coast. She here first uses the name Grey Foxes, which is something Roberta will reiterate upon in upcoming episodes. Chang seems actually flustered at this news, and Edda explains that this is to happen at the end of the month. She gives him the location of the soldiers and he motions to hang up, but she reiterates that she isn't finished yet. She wants to know what he's going to do about this. Chang tries to tell her to fuck off and tells her that the triad aren't going to do the CIA's dirty work, but Edda says that he couldn't have been more wrong, and then describes the CIA in an elaborate way to scare him. The stupid thug comment at the end really gets to him and he crushes his phone. This is Chang's literal worst fear, the CIA is blackmailing him into doing what they want and threatening to destroy Rowanapa as a whole if he doesn't cooperate. Even though she is bluffing here, he can't afford to take that risk. We cut back to the crackhead to end the episode as he remembers the name of the guy that they are looking for, and the group rushes off to find this Leroy bloke. And then we fade into the marching tune, which every time it happens gets me even more pumped. We open on the group heading in the direction of the maid while the Americans start realising that shit is happening around them and they begin to prepare to get the fuck out of Dodge. 
we see the imported Colombian troops arrive and get into fighting position. Revy, realizing what position she's in, calls Chinglish and the gang to convince them to come and help. There's also a cute scene here of Sawyer and the wizard dude playing video game. Back with the Americans, Shane begins to realize that they have wandered into a massive clusterfuck. Some Rwanda natives are involved in this whole situation for some reason I forget and attack the Americans first but are easily outsmarted and the Americans get away. The Colombian troops stay hidden because their main target is Roberta and they want to get her back. The Americans are showing just how good they are but they are unaware that the bloodhound is watching them. They notice her in the distance with a sniper on them and they use smoke grenades to avoid the confrontation. We see the state of Roberta here as she's clearly going insane. Revy shows up with the entire gang at the scene. Back with the Rock and Garcia now, Rock reiterates to Garcia that Dutch said that if this ever were to happen, that he was supposed to get out of Dodge immediately. But obviously Rock refuses and says he won't abandon Garcia. Garcia, surrounded by all this madness, decides to power on and Chinglish praises him for his bravery. He's going with them onto the battlefield even when Rock is staying in the car. Before they split up, Rock gives Garcia a letter but tells him to only open it when he loses his way. This is possibly the thing that could ruin Roberta's blood trail for people in general. This is some death note pre-planning shit and it's possible that Rock is too smart here. Everything else Rock predicts in this arc I think is acceptable based on his experience in Rowanapa and his tactfulness that's been teased from the very beginning. So it's not like the show pulled this out of their ass. Plus this plan doesn't go exactly according to plan. He isn't just right about everything, he never discovers the CIA in influence on the city or the CIA missing link. Even if he does succeed in saving Roberta Garcia and Fabiola by the end of it, it doesn't all entirely go to plan. Additionally, the contents of the letter is just directions to a getaway vehicle that will lead them to the ship. It isn't something stupid itself. So I'm willing to look past this letter situation due to the outside context. Revy talks to Fabiola as they walk away from the car, warning her that not going for the kill could get her or Garcia killed in this situation. Revy brings up the example at the bar where she didn't kill anyone and explains that she could tell that that was her first time shooting at actual people. The Americans successfully get away from Roberta and the Colombians move in on Roberta. This triple threat match is playing out just as Rock predicted. Roberta slaughters the initial group of attacking troops. These are not Hotel Moscow level men. Revy and the gang end up killing a bunch of the Colombians as well. Back to that Hotel Moscow comparison, Revy would never shoot at the guys from Hotel Moscow because Balalaika would retaliate. The Colombians clearly don't have that reputation because her and Chinglish show no apprehension about slaughtering these faceless idiots. Shane has great running commentary throughout all of this. Why am I getting the feeling she's got this all figured out and we're being played like a bunch of fucking newbies? We hard cut to Fabiola's traumatized face as she looks over the destruction Revy and the gang have left in their wake. Revy and Chinglish start making fun of the dead soldiers and are mad that they can't question any of them because they're all dead. Sawyer finds one that's still alive and Fabiola is made translator, and Revy promises to take the soldier to the hospital if he complies. The soldier points them westward, and Fabiola starts to comfort the soldiers, and Revy goes back on the deal and executes him on the spot. This naturally creates a lot of tension and makes Fabiola incredibly angry. She still doesn't understand how this game works, and thankfully she probably never will. Fabiola accuses Revy of enjoying the act of killing, and Revy and Chinglish start lecturing her. Revy's voice actress is particularly out of this world here. Mini maid, you got the wrong end of that puppy pointed at me. What the fuck are you thinking? Garcia keeps the peace and reiterates that he wants to focus on finding Roberta. Later, when Garcia and Fabiola are alone, Garcia says that he doesn't want Fabiola to become like them and lose herself before they find Roberta. He wants them all to go back and live peacefully in the mansion. We then cut back to Rock, who admits that he doesn't know if Garcia will catch up to Roberta, but by the way he's talking about it, it seems irrelevant to the successfulness of his plan. He notes that the Americans have nowhere to hide in the city and that Roberta will not let them out of her sights. Rock explains that if he wants to save them, he has to coerce another player to come out of hiding. He then gets a call from Chang that he admits he doesn't need right now. This call is fantastic and efficiently shows off the fundamental difference between Chang and Rock. Chang does two things here. He gloats that Rock is losing and that the odds are stacked gigantically against him while also manipulating him into doing what he wants. Chang calls Rock a hypocrite that's trying to act moralistically and explains that the kids don't matter anymore because bigger things are at play and that Rowana in general is in danger. Rock calls Chang a piece of shit and Chang finds it amusing that someone actually has the balls to talk to him like that. 
This is where Rock concedes the game and admits to himself that if he wants to save the kids, he has to do what Chang wants, and that is to get the conflict out of the city. He doesn't care if Chang wins as long as he can save the kids and Roberta. Chang also warns him about losing his soul to win this game. The call ends and Rock is angry afterwards because his pride is being insulted. We cut back to the triple threat match going on. The native Rowena Pathugs are still out there on the streets and they and the Colombians end up shooting at each other because of miscommunication. They are both apparently massive groups of morons. Revy and the gang are surveying the situation close by and decide that they can take them out no problem. They kill the Colombians and the civilians equally. Garcia and Fabiola end up going off on their own and are confronted by the Colombians, but are saved by Sawyer and Wizard. Garcia and Fabiola are then separated and Garcia wanders into the same building Roberta is currently in. The fights everywhere continue. The Colombians attack Roberta and Garcia realizes she's nearby and heads after her. He finds her and she is fighting the one Colombian commander. He outmaneuvers her because he knows all of her moves because they were trained the same way. He pins her down and explains that he wants her to rejoin the organization. She then gives him a false sense of security by demeaning the mansion she worked for as a maid and using her body to get his attention. The dramatic irony here is that Garcia is listening into this not knowing that she's manipulating him. She agrees to this proposal and motions to fuck, and he goes for it like a moron and she ends up shooting him with a hidden gun she had on her belt buckle. Garcia is relieved slightly that she was lying to him. She shit-talks the stupid revolution and calls him a pig as he bleeds out. She explains that she is only loyal to Garcia and that she is doing all of this for him. Garcia then reveals himself, thinking she'll go back with him now after hearing what he just heard. Instead, she freaks out because he just overheard all of that, and she lets out one hell of a scream. No! 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 We get reaction shots from a variety of characters putting over the scream. She goes completely insane and concludes that this must be another hallucination and says that this is her mind playing tricks on her because this is the absolute last thing she would ever want to see. Roberta then starts seeing the hallucination from before again and he explains his backstory. We went over that earlier and again it will be very important by the end of the arc. He describes himself as only a little cut in a massive wound that she had quelled by working at the manor but is now re-exposed by coming back to this place. She asks what is the point if she can never forget and blames the hallucination for killing the master, showing that she's really lost the plot. She rationalises that she'll shoot Garcia to prove that he's a hallucination. The episode ends with the Americans rushing in and saving Garcia from the insane Roberta. Shane wonders who the hell the boy is and we cut back to Rock who is looking in his windscreen waiting for the other player to reveal themselves. The episode opens with the Americans explaining that they are nice boys and that they had to save Garcia from that situation. We see the scene of them saving Garcia that was breezed over last episode. The Americans all agree that the soldiers made the right decision in saving Garcia. Revy and the gang run towards the scream and are now in the same building as Roberta who has completely gone insane at this point. Revy senses that she's here and Chinglish foolishly charges. Roberta destroys her and goes for the kill, but Wizard and Sawyer try and interfere, but they get taken out too. But Roberta just keeps marching forward, ignoring them. Revy hides behind a wall or something, and Fabiola tries to reason with her, but Roberta has lost her mind and rambles about being home soon. Garcia wakes up with the Americans, and the dramatic irony and tension is palpable in this moment. These are the men responsible for all of this, Roberta's insanity, and more importantly, his father's death. We cut to Rock who somehow predicts that Roberta might not recognize Garcia and that if so, his role in the plan would change. As long as Garcia doesn't do anything crazy, everything should go as planned. He goes on to say that the next move in the plan has him stumped and that after two days of planning, he can only predict that someone who controls the city from the shadows will be calling him. He's so right and wrong at the same time in this opinion. It's clever of him to have figured out that there is some shadowy figure controlling Rowanapa, but when that figure presents itself to him, he doesn't put it together. We cut to Garcia possibly doing the crazy thing that Rock needed him not to do, and he pulls a gun on the American soldiers. They immediately restrain him and ask him why he'd do something like that, and he explains the situation with his father and Roberta. When he mentions Roberta, we get an interesting flashback of Roberta walking on the beach from the old OP covered in blood. It's a cool visual. Shane offers Garcia a gun and says that he's earned the right to take revenge and that he can decide if he wants to himself. 
We then get a fantastic flashback to his father teaching him about the importance of understanding perspective. He's using the memory of one of his father's lessons to forgive his father's killers. This is a neat turn of sympathy and forgiveness showing Garcia is still a good person. This world has not corrupted him yet, just as Rock had planned. We cut to Rock, and just like he anticipated, the shadowy figure controlling Rowanifer shows up, but he just doesn't realise it. Edda shows up, notifying him that she delivered the goods to the place that he requested. These include fake passports, among other things vital to Rock's plan. She notifies Rock also that Balalaika and Hotel Moscow have begun taking position around the city. Rock says that he already expected that, and Edda tells a very clever Cold War joke. It's the Cold War all over again. The proud Deshantniki facing down their old enemy. We then cut back to the situation with Garcia and the Americans. Shane's men are not ready to let Garcia kill him and have drawn their guns on Garcia. The Americans are then made aware of Balalaika's presence. She makes contact with them and warns them that Roberta is right above them. I hope Grey Fox can hear this, Major. She's right above you. Better act fast. Roberta literally mounts Shane and acknowledges Garcia, but she is still rambling like a madwoman. Hotel Moscow creates separation between them and warns them to retreat immediately. Rock then explains that Balalaika may use this opportunity to settle the score with Chang. She doesn't want to actually engage with the Americans because they would just end up killing each other off. Ultimately, what Balalaika really wants from this situation is to fuck things up for Chang. Etta praises him for his knowledge and says that judging from the radio chatter, everything that he says is coming to pass. Etta isn't letting up here for a second, she is completely completely in character and not even hinting yet that she knows some shit. Edda asks what will happen if the Americans pussy out and abort the mission, but he reassures her what she already knows and that America can't lose face in this situation. Edda then acknowledges that the stuff he brought from her will be very useful indeed. Edda tries to end the conversation and drive off. She's already made preparations for Roberta to follow them out of the city, as we will see later on. Rock stops her from leaving and shows some suspicion in Edda, but evidently not enough. He asks her what she's getting out of all of this. He means in general, not necessarily hinting towards that she's CIA or anything. He's still, from what I can tell, pretty clueless. He says that he would have suspected that she was getting paid by the triad as well. Etta warns Rock to be careful. Her character is starting to slip. She speculates that Rock is starting to think about choosing sides in all of this. Rock comes out and just says that Chang runs Rowanapur even if the Mafias act like they share power. Etta wants to know what Rock's point is. She starts starting to realise that he really is starting to figure things out. He continues saying that there's no way he'd survive without major support, and Rock wants to know who the real mastermind behind Rowanapur is. The irony here. Etta warns him about looking into this with a clever line. I wouldn't, Rock. It's never wise to dive down to where the Leviathan waits in the dark. She then makes a joke about there being many different gods and not all of them getting along. This joke is referring to the different agencies of America not all getting along in this very situation. Edda tells Rock to give God a call as we cut away. Another great scene built on the principles of tension and dramatic irony. This show's fucking great. We cut back to the Americans. They praise Hotel Moscow for their technique and defense tactics, but they share some confusion about them being USSR troops even though the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Garcia, who is still with them, decides to open Rock's letter now since he's unsure about how he feels regarding the Americans after remembering his father's teachings. It's the map we discussed earlier and Garcia asks himself if Rock somehow knew exactly what was going to happen. Rock then has to call Dutch to commission the job and transport the Americans out of the city. The only problem is Dutch is mega pissed at Rock at the moment. Benny picks up and warns Rock about how mad Dutch is and then gives Dutch the phone. They have great dialogue here between them. Dutch gives off a more disappointed than angry appearance and Rock offers him a job with the US government as the client. Rock finalises the conversation by telling Dutch that they can make a killing through this scenario. Dutch freaks out and tells Benny to hang up. He doesn't recognise this Rock, and he knows he's playing into his sensibilities by offering him a monetary value in exchange for this crazy fucking plan. Dutch is not a gambler, and Rock is gambling quite a bit here. The phone then rings immediately again, and Dutch assumes it's Rock and tries to refuse the offer, but it wasn't Rock, it was Chang who convinces them to take the job. Dutch then has a line about the maid not being the only one that'll need a shrink after this. He's concluded that Rock is fucked. We cut back to Revy and the gang who have found the location of Garcia and the Americans. Revy and Chinglish think they can take the Americans out and get Garcia back before they realise it, but before they can act, Hotel Moscow shoot them both in the arms, rendering them useless on the battlefield. 
They then warn Revy that next time they'll shoot to kill. Revy gets mad and yells at them for shooting both of her shooting arms. Fabiola is then reunited with Garcia, and Garcia shows everyone the map and they head off to the truck. When they get there, Shane comments on this place being so fucked up that even the church are gun pushers. They note that even though they have two kids with them now, the mission cannot be cancelled. They must capture the triad drug lord. We cut to them riding down the main street of Rowanapa and Roberta is in full pursuit. Balalaika makes contact with Shane again and delivers what may be the best speech in this entire show. This is another scene I would demand everyone go back and watch. Balalaika admits that they really wanted to fight them because they have waited for a great war for a long time. There's mutual respect here. Shane and Balalaika compare the embarrassments of both of their countries in Vietnam for the Americans and Afghanistan for the Russians. Or more aptly, for the Soviets. Balalaika then lets out her rant talking about how her and Shane are exactly the same, yet they have been treated so differently by their respective home countries. Balalaika continues saying that that's all in the past and that they have regressed so far now that they are among the walking dead in Rowanapa. Balalaika reiterates that she hates being one of the walking dead and envies those allowed to fight in the world of the living. All she wants is for all of her men and her to go back to being a standing official army. She says she wants the Americans to see their power before they go back to the world of the living to know that if they had ever faced each other on the battlefield, that Hotel Moscow would have showed them real fear. Roberta then shows up and Balalaika gives a proper send-off as they fire massive amounts of shit at Roberta. Shane puts them over strong, praising them for their power. But Balalaika gives the speech-making line about being treated like outcasts. Those are kind words, and it's a considerable honor to receive your compliment. But tell me, if we're both from the elite units of our nations, then why did our country treat us like outcasts? This speech shows the bitterness and vulnerability that motivates Balalaika's every move. The desperation and bitterness in her voice tells you more about this character than anything that has ever been shown in this entire series. The rawness in the scene is unbelievable, and Balalaika and Hotel Moscow are completely sympathetic here maybe for the first time ever. Shane then asks if she was discharged from the military because of an illness, but she says it was a voluntary discharge, but in reality she deserted after saving a child from a refugee camp that was getting slaughtered. I'm not surprised that you would think that it was called a voluntary discharge, but the reality is I deserted. It was an easy decision to make. There was an illegal international mission. I saved a child in a refugee camp. And that's what the media reported. All this happened in 1986. April. This is a key connector of nearly everyone in Rowanapa. At one time, they had moral courage but lost it, like Rock nearly loses it in this arc to save someone. This also draws a further parallel between Shane and Balalaika, because at the beginning of this OVA series, we saw Shane doing exactly the same thing, saving a refugee in Vietnam. But again, to Balalaika's point, he wasn't shamed by his country and thrown out of the military like she was for doing exactly the same thing. In Balalaika's instance where she tried to save a child, she was thrown out and lost everything. Rock is trying to do the same thing now, and this is supposed to build anticipation to see how his trial through this exact same situation will pan out. If he can even save the children, that is. She then tells them to get the hell out of their city and that she never wants to see them again. We cut to Rock who says there's so much going on in the city and inside his head. Revy interrupts and we see that he collected her after she was taken out by Hotel Moscow. She asks him if he still knows what he's doing and Rock reassures her. Revy says he wouldn't be able to rely on her anymore and Rock says that's okay and Revy is low-key pissed that she was used by him as a small piece in this much, much larger puzzle. They arrive at the ship and they take everyone with them, the Americans and the kids. Rock's plan is working so far and Dutch even puts him over saying that he was almost too efficient in getting all these fake licenses and passports, as well as getting guns from the ripoff church and Chang to commission the job. Dutch is even sort of forgiving Rock at this point. Chang is then notified that the ship has left the harbour and seems pleased with himself. Another triad member who we have seen praise him throughout his arc praises him again for his manipulation of both Rock and Balalaika to get everyone out of the city successfully. This isn't entirely true, even though they did do what he wanted them to do, they both had their own goals in doing these actions. He just got what he wanted as a byproduct of both of these characters' independent options. So it sort of was manipulation, but it sort of wasn't. Chang isn't entirely in control like his lackey here would like you to believe. Obviously, we know about his connections and his subservience to the CIA. 
The other dude drops here that Chang used to be a Hong Kong police officer that killed his partner and says that he has some fucking big balls. Chang is loving life right now and tells him to stop making him blush. We cut back to Dutch introducing himself to the Americans and reminding them that they still have to deal with Roberta once they land. He's taking out some of that anger that we mentioned earlier on the Americans here in this scene. Benny shows up explaining that Dutch is in a bad mood and reaffirms them that Dutch is the best at these routes and even drops that Dutch was stationed in this area in the Vietnam War, which is the first time we're hearing about that. Benny also awkwardly tells them to stay out of his room. We then cut to a plane taking off with Roberta and Edda on it. Edda looks astoundingly different in this scene. She's in full CAA mode here. Edda makes fun of Roberta smelling like shit and mocks her for letting the foxes get away. Edda explains that she arranged for her to get onto this plane so she should be thankful. Roberta goes to attack but Edda blocks it with her suitcase. They talk and it's awesome. It's awesome to see Edda going head to head with Roberta here and holding her own. Chinglish, Fabiola, Revy, they all tried this but they had no plan like Edda has here and they were undercut by Roberta immediately. Revy didn't even try. But here Edda has a plan and knows what she's doing and she easily outsmarts and manipulates Roberta here. You're being too fucking loud you moron. Shut up and listen. I'm trying to tell you where your stupid foxes are going and I even made all the arrangements to get you there. Edda then explains that she's leading her to her foxes and Roberta thanks her, promising her that her death will be painless when this is all over. We cut back to the boat travels and they have stopped to get some fuel. Revy approaches Fabiola who is studying English idioms, which is interesting, and Garcia is by himself processing everything that's going on. Revy comments that Rock is about to unleash another stupid fucking plan. She's still clearly salty about getting shot in both of her arms because of this plan. Revy laments that if the shooting starts, they will have to rely on Fabiola because her arms are all fucked up. Fabiola points out that Rock is dangerous and that she doesn't like this situation at all. She's mad that Rock orchestrated Garcia to meet up with the Americans, and that's why Garcia is currently in the state he's in. Revy goes back to her old insults saying that Rock should go back to his normal life and relax because he's not suited to be gambling with people's lives. This is when it becomes evident that Revy isn't paying attention to Rock and is ignoring all of his faults. We've been saying this since part two of this series. Fabiola notices this disconnect and pounces on it, creating another one of the best scenes in the entire show. That list is probably three pages long due to how many times I've said that line now, but it sticks. This show is really good. Fabiola starts by asking if she actually thinks this, then why hasn't she toughened him up? And she also asks what Revy truly wants from him. Revy doesn't answer and Fabiola determines that Revy admires him but thinks if she digs too deep, he might not be the perfect person she imagines him to be. Revy laughs off this challenge like she always does and then calls Fabiola deluded. Fabiola doesn't relent saying that the person that Revy describes Rock to be and the Rock that she has been witness to throughout this arc are two completely different people. Fabiola doesn't see the person who isn't cut out for this but a ruthless manipulator who gets what he wants. Revy hasn't been paying attention and hasn't realised that the Rock that she once knew and glorified is gone. She continues further saying that Revy refuses to see his true nature because she would then lose her shining knight. Fabiola is basically corroborating everything that we've been saying so far this entire video series. Revy reiterates calling her crazy again when really Revy knows that what she is saying is true. She literally goes into a reflective depression after this talk because it destroys her so bad mentally. Fabiola doesn't give up explaining that Revy imagines Rock as the opposite of herself so he can be a hero to her. Revy is silent. Fabiola also rejects what Revy has been saying the whole time about them being from the same place. Revy asks her how they are any different and Fabiola explains that they had very different upbringings. She may have grown up in a poverty stricken shithole but she had a family that loved her and supported her unlike Revy. Revy says that Fabiola is insane if she thinks that herself and Garcia are the same. She notably avoided responding to everything Fabiola just said. Fabiola addresses this and says that Revy really is dumb after all. Revy then gets mad and even draws her gun on Fabiola, showing that Revy clearly still doesn't like to be challenged. Fabiola ends the talk with the chilling line, The funny thing is, you think Rock is completely innocent, but he's not. 
we cut to Rock and Garcia who have a little talk to end the episode. Obviously this draws a parallel to the fantastic previous scene with Fabiola and Revy. Rock menacingly gives Garcia a gun and says that this is the final piece of the puzzle. We have never seen Rock with a gun, so this makes the audience realize that what Fabiola is saying was true. Rock has changed. We open the final episode of this series, continuing our conversation between Rock and Garcia from the end of episode 28. Garcia notes that Rock's face looks threatening for the first time. Rock is literally treated like a movie monster in this shot as he slowly moves forward, and Garcia slowly backs away. We cut to the continuation of the Revy and Fabiola conversation. Fabiola continues with their explanation of how they aren't the same. She says it's because of the people they encountered in their lives. Revy says whatever happens in life just happens and that she just puts her trust in her guns, and that her guns will always beat Fabiola's lame-ass footwork, Revy's trying to say that she only trusts in her power to survive, and doesn't need the people she's encountered along the way to survive, and because of that, she is better than Fabiola in her own mind. We cut back to Rock, who gives Garcia the gun and says that this gun will bring the game to an end. We cut back to Fabiola, who says that when Revy snares at people, she looks like a skeleton dancing at the Festival of the Dead. Revy laughs quite a bit at this and says that it's the perfect description. Revy revels in the description saying that she is indeed one well-armed fucking skeleton, and that the soldiers and her head maid are exactly the same. Revy says that she's just a pathetic little shit who's going to die here. She's bullshitting here to act like she won the argument, when in reality this conversation will cut very deep. If the constant cutting between the conversations weren't enough to indicate that these two conversations were a parallel to each other, we then get dual shots of Rock and Revy walking away from Fabiola and Garcia, and we get the kids' dual reactions afterwards. Then Garcia and Fabiola have a private talk, saying how much they don't like getting pushed around by these idiots. Garcia ends up jumping into the ocean, and when Fabiola tries to pull him out, he pulls her in. They have a childish moment of fun in the ocean here that is notably drawn to be elegant and almost supernatural. Revy is shown freaking the fuck out and kicking shit in the cabin. Garcia reinsures Fabiola that he's fine now, and that they will save Roberta no matter what, and will never allow her to fall into this state again. Fabiola seems dismissive of this, seemingly having already given up on Roberta, but she sees that Garcia's mind is made up and she decides to support him. I think the point is here that Fabiola and Garcia's relationship is a far healthier version of Rock and Revy's relationship. For the first time, this isn't a parallel between either Rock or Revy, it's a parallel to the relationship itself. We cut back to Revy who's still peeved about the conversation, and particularly gets hung up on Fabiola talking about her loving family. We get the flashback I talked about in detail in part one, with her terrible childhood, including her rape and subsequent murder of her father. This is the full flashback that's been teased up until this point, and it didn't disappoint in its graphic nature. It's terrible. She notes after we see this flashback that she wanted to forget about all this shit. We cut to Shane and Garcia who create a plan off-screen. Fabiola then approaches Rock and asks him what crazy idea he's put into Garcia's head, and then Rock tells her what's supposed to happen again off-screen. We see her reaction afterwards and she thinks it's crazy and certainly doesn't approve of the plan. Rock slams his hand over her like Balalaika did to him in Japan and Chaka did to Revy before that, asserting his dominance over her, and explains that we can't win without taking risks. I don't know if this is necessarily the company Rock wants to keep in this motif. Fabiola says Rock planned this all out from the start and gets frustrated, and Rock then explains that the only X Factor here is the Americans. They're the only ones he doesn't fully understand. Rock says waiting to see how luck will play out is the sweetest part of the plan, and Fabiola says that that's bullshit, and we get a match cut to Revy also saying bullshit. It's an audio match shot. It's pretty cool. They arrive and Dutch tells the Americans to get the fuck off his boat after they thank him. He still is clearly unhappy about this entire scenario, and after a moment of reflection, he apologises to them, saying that this place really gets to him. He's referencing being reminded of his past in the war, and the stress of knowing Roberta is nearby. They all arrive and leave the ship, including the kids who accompany Shane's group. As we leave, Rock celebrates, thinking Mr. Chang is finally going to lose. Rock thinks his operation is about to get arrested by the Americans. It's noteworthy that Rock isn't celebrating the likely survival of saving Roberta and the kids, but the fact that Chang will lose. It shows him what his priorities in this situation truly were, at least at this time. We cut to the soon-to-be battlefield, and the scenery here is quite beautiful. 
This place is actually pretty gorgeous. The tension builds as the Americans split into two teams and wander throughout the environment. They all notice some strange rods in the ground everywhere that indicates that Roberta is already here and she has probably laid some traps. Roberta is back in her signature maid outfit for a final confrontation here. We are shown everyone but Revy on the ship listening to the fight on the radios. Roberta in her first strike kills two Americans and gets shot herself once. We then cut back to Shane who goes on another anti-Vietnam war rant. It fits in context. A hell of a lot of dirty tricks and some vicious fighting in Vietnam made me pretty much an expert. And then some on jungle warfare. If this were Guadalcanal, we'd be humping mortars. If this were Nam, we'd burn down the whole jungle with a sky full of napalm. Along with the people we were trying to help. It's then revealed that the rods are ammunition for her musket, which is pretty fucking terrifying. She kills one sniper but gets hit for a second time, but continues running. She's totaling four kills now, and has lost some of her fingers. There's also a brutal scene here of her literally shaking off some of her fingers. She kills three more soldiers after taking more shots. She laughs over the radio and then kills an eighth American, who was one of the ones with more characterization than the bunch through some of the previous scenes. She starts laughing again and is interrupted by Garcia over the radio. He gives her his location and tells her to come find him. We cut back to the ship where Revy is telling herself that she knows exactly what she is. She's having another identity crisis here. Then we cut to the deck where Rock is smoking alone listening to the conflict. Revy walks up to him and he tells her that it'll all be over soon. She is pissed like she was in episode 7 and says who gives a shit. She brings up that she has been getting worked up over things that she tried really fucking hard to forget and blames Rock for it. He says that he knows and brags about feeling like everyone is dancing on the palm of his hand. He's starting to seem sociopathic at this point. In Japan, Revy was incredibly comforting to Rock in his time of need, but now Revy comes to him with an issue and this is the response she gets. She isn't happy about this, she understands this hypocrisy. Revy asks what the fuck is going on with him, and Revy admits out loud that the mini-maid may have been right about him. Revy says that Rock's totally changed and that Roanapa has fucked him up too much. It's important to reiterate here that she is the one that brought him into this world. She points her gun at him for the first time in a long time and talks with the same tone she had in the submarine. She says that after this job he needs to get the fuck out. If Rock is so far gone that he can no longer save her, then what use does he have to Revy now? I don't think she sees any current value in him. Eventually she'll calm down and understand that they have grown together over the series and that she might be fine living with him of her side in the twilight in the future. But in this moment she's just pissed. Rock says that he doesn't know what she's talking about and reiterates that it's almost over. Revy comments that she doesn't even know who he is anymore. We cut back to the battlefield where Roberta is limping her destroyed body and in the direction of the Americans. The kids admit to being scared as she approaches and Fabiola gives Garcia a hug and gets ready to go through with the plan. We cut back to Rock who's talking to Revy about the boat patrols and and then reiterates again on the game nearly being over. Revy says that he keeps going on about this game and asks how he can be so sure that he's got all this figured out. Rock ignores her and reiterates that it'll all be over soon. He's clearly become obsessed. Revy asks him if he can even hear himself and he just says he knows what's going to happen down this path. The plan then happens, it's a convoluted plot to trick Roberta into shooting Garcia after Garcia fake shoots Shane to prove to himself and to Roberta that they are both sinners. Now they can heal together. Garcia makes it clear to Roberta that he never wanted revenge and Roberta admits to being haunted by ghosts every night. Again, take note because this will be important later. In the middle here we cut back to Rock who explains to Revy why Chang and Balalaika let this plan work. He says it's because Chang wanted to use Roberta to break the NSA agent's will so they wouldn't attempt to shut down the drug trade in the region, which is the main funding agent of Rowanapa. That was Chang's original plan. But Rock has arranged it so the NSA agents will not be broken and will finish their mission by capturing the triad official behind the drug trade and saving Roberta and the kids. Revy asks what Rock gets out of any of this and we cut away before he can answer, but she had it right in the first two episodes of this arc. It's all about Yukio and saving people. Rock sacrifices himself here. He finally dove into the darkness to save the three of them and prove to himself that it was possible to save someone after failing time after time. We then end up back on the battlefield as the plan continues and Roberta screams about the foxes having to die. Garcia shoots Shane, Roberta threatens to shoot Garcia and we cut back to 
Rock and Revy before we see the climax. Revy asks Rock if this is his revenge on Roanapa, and he says that the city messes people up so bad that when he tries to reach out and help them, he seems to be unable to save a single soul. Revy brings up Yukio again, and he interrupts, saying this time he's going to make a real difference and the city isn't going to stop him. We flash back to the battlefield, and they are both unaffected by the shots. We then continue this flashing back and forward and we are back with Rock and Revy. Revy asks what's going to happen to him now. She also says that he can never go back now and that for the longest time he stood in the twilight but now he's joined her in the darkness. He says he did it to win the game and that this was the only way to finish it. He says that he's fine with it because he understands what Revy felt the entire time. Revy then beats the shit out of him for saying that. Finally, back on the battlefield, the scene concludes with Roberta apologizing for shooting him and then Garcia kisses Roberta, not on the cheek, mind you. I think this is supposed to symbolize him becoming a man and shows that he is in control of this situation and how he can now look after her, but it is a bit weird. She still shows concern for him being shot after he collapses onto her. Shane gets back up and Roberta motions to kill him, but Garcia tells her not to and to forget about it and she actually listens. He says he already killed him and that now they're both killers and they can share this burden as they live together in peace. Somehow Roberta has come out of all of this alive. I think Garcia sums up the entire point of this arc in his last monologue. He and Roberta will now suffer through the loss of his father because it's better to suffer together than alone. This same principle applies to Rock and Revy now. They are both on the same dark side. It's better for Rock to now understand where Revy is coming from so they can suffer together, possibly finally becoming a couple. Suffering together rather than alone to help each other with the burden of life seems to be the intended message here, and it's done effectively. We cut back to the boat and Benny finds Rock laid out and bruised. Benny asks what happened and points to the returning soldiers having succeeded. Rock asks if they got the triad guy and Benny informs him that there are three stretches, and Rock rejoices saying that this was the best case scenario. He saved them all and dealt a blow to Chang, assumingly. We find out right after this that this doesn't affect Chang in the slightest. Fabiola confronts Rock and is mighty pissed. She points her gun at Rock saying that they got lucky, extremely lucky, and points out how the plan worked with the blank. She says that they are never coming back here and hopes that they never have to see Rock again. She tells him to dance with the rest of them in that dead city. Rock ignores her, saying that no matter what she says, they manage to win today. He wants them to never return, so this is a win-win situation for him, even if Fabiola doesn't realise it. She's also playing right into his hands. We cut back to the literal CIA, and Edda is on the phone with the boss that was shown at the beginning of this entire arc. He tells her that at the next meeting between the CIA and the NSA, everything will be cleared up, and the CIA will be getting custody of the triad drug peddler. He explains how the NSA are not happy about this. Everything they went through in this operation was seemingly for nothing because the CIA is undermined at all, thanks to Edda. The CIA in this scene shows that they benefit from the drug trade in the South China Sea, and that they won't let it fall apart that easily. It's in their best interest to keep Rowanapa afloat. So whereas the perceived threat was America ruining Rowanapa, it's actually America keeping Rowanapa intact. They are the backers Rock talked about. They support Chang, and Edda secretly has the most power in Rowanapa. This is why Chang isn't affected by the things that Rock did in this episode. Rock doesn't understand this in the following scene, but he's playing with entities far bigger than himself or even Chang. But he did end up saving people. If Rock really wants to change Rowanapa, he's going to have to somehow defeat the CIA, which would be one hell of a Black Lagoon R. We cut back to the ship and Rock is overlooking Rowanapa months after the events with Roberta. This shot is fucking magical and I love it. He notes that Chang gave them a bonus and Rock mentions all the time that's passed and that everything is back to normal in Rowanapa. What he did had no effect, just like I said. The bonus Chang gives them seems to be him shoving it in the face of Rock that nothing has changed. Dutch, who is now friendly with Rock again, time heals or wounds seemingly, says that money and guns will never go out of style and that that's not going to change anytime soon. Rock thinks to himself that somewhere out there, someone else won the bet and that he didn't really save anybody. He still hasn't fully figured out the CIA element in the city and after all, they are the one who actually won this bet. But he says here that he didn't save anyone when that's not true at all. We'll see in a minute that he saved Roberta Garcia and Fabiola. They all now get to live in peace, so I think he's being overdramatic here or I'm missing something. 
Why would he say he hasn't saved anyone? Credits then begin to roll and we see a happy ending with Roberta and Garcia in another beautiful scene, visually speaking. Roberta has a fake leg and is missing some fingers, but is now sane again and living in the manor. In this shot, she's holding the picture of the family of the innocent man she killed that's been haunting her. It took a few watches for me to figure that out, but it seems to be the case. She seems to be going down a true path of redemption. And the people she's meeting here seemingly are the family, and she's going to somehow compensate them for what she took from them. The ending here is also a bit bittersweet and unsure. We cut back to Rock on the ship in the same position as the previous scene. Revy shows up and they seem to be friendly again after the time skip. She tells him that it's going to continue to hurt if he keeps looking under that city with the life in his eyes. But she says that's the path he's chosen. Humans are like dice, they throw themselves in any direction. She shoots into the city with her gun hand and says that they have to continue doing what they can to not end up dead. Rock then makes the same gun hand but doesn't shoot into the city. He just looks at it. She says that he came pretty damn close back there, and and Rock says yeah as he doesn't shoot. He says this wasn't the time, but maybe someday it will be, as the show fades away for one final time. What are they talking about in this final scene? Are they saying that Rock didn't actually leave the twilight? Because I don't think that's true. I think that they are talking about him making a difference in the city and promising one day to change it together. For the better. That's it, the ending reiterates on the facing terror together message as we are left wanting more. I hear the manga has another whole completed arc now, so following the editing and uploading of these videos I'll go read that. Probably from the beginning. After I might make a video on it, but I'll see. I have suspicions that it might actually be the first time I find an anime that originates from a manga better than the source material. Just purely because of the dialogue and acting performances that make this show as I've demonstrated throughout this massive series. I don't necessarily have a sweeping statement that concludes everything, because this series by definition isn't finished yet, so I expect maybe a part 5 in a few years, I don't know. That being said, I think I've demonstrated periodically what I find to be so addicting and lovable about this amazing series, and have proved that Rock and Revy are the driving force behind Black Lagoon, and that Black Lagoon, maybe, is the best anime ever. So that's the end of this massive endeavour for me, and a slightly smaller endeavour for you. But before we leave, let's collectively have some group self-reflection. All these characters from Balalaika to Revy all just want to have a normal life like you and I. So let me ask you something, what the fuck are you doing with the life that these characters just want an opportunity for? Hurry up and don't waste it. So that's it, we're finally at the end. I want to thank everyone that stuck around until the end of this series. This script was written back in February of this year. I remember fucking slaving away trying to get this completed, thinking that this would all be out by the end of March. I don't even think the first video came out until April, and now we're sitting in September and I'm finally getting around to finishing it. Originally it was just going to be three parts, and part one and part two were supposed to be one video, but I got iffy and I really wanted to get it out there, so I just uploaded part one. I think it's the first six episodes of uh, the first season. Um, but the, uh, the the part three and four have been what they were originally planned to be. It's been a fucking long time. A lot of you have waited a long time for this. Um, so much has changed. Uh, the scripts for these were not the best uh, since they were written back in February. Um, but people seem to like them uh, despite that. Um, they're longer videos. They're the longest video I did. I remember when I first had the idea for this video back in like December of last year. Jesus Christ, it's been so long. I think I've been working on this since the, uh, since my, I uploaded my first video, uh, way back in December. So it's been a fucking, this has been the story of my channel so far. It's always been a monkey on my back. I'm fucking super glad that it's finally done. When I'm speaking these words, it's not actually done, and I've got massive editing to do, plus I have to edit the audio of the last few uh, segments I've recorded. It's going to be painful. It's the 29th right now, and this has to be out by the 1st to go along with my plan. So fuck me, I'm in for a few days of worrying. I'd like to stress that uh, support for this series, uh, it's what got me and to anywhere that I'm at on Patreon right now. It's not a very big Patreon. I'd like to plug it now. If you enjoyed this, I will definitely be making some more Black Lagoon videos in the future. Um, Obviously, I'm planning to upload a video every day this month, and at least two of them i have planning to be on Black Lagoon, so subscribe to stick around for that. I have a video where I want to sort of reiterate on this entire series a little bit, um, and talk about 
sort of summarize the point of this video uh, in like eight minutes or something of this video series rather in eight minutes. Um, so that'll be interesting. And then I want to make a video about the manga this month since I'll be uploading a video every month and I'll need some ideas. Um, I got to read the manga first. I got to find time for that. Uh, it's a stressful period right now, trying to work to the bone. So any support would be appreciated. I got a Streamlabs link where you can make single donations, Patreon, where you can show continued support. Subscribing would be a very big deal. Getting to a thousand subscribers is a very important thing in a YouTube channel. And I really want to get there soon. So that'd be a massive help. That would probably be the most helpful thing you could do. So please subscribe, do all the other things like whatever, comment comment something that's clever or funny or something. With that all being said, support links in the description below, and thanks.